Okay, that was probably good enough. Hi, everybody! Um, oh, I forgot to quit out of this game. Hold on. Let me... Let me do that. Do, uh, uh, I guess there's no save. There's no, like, active saving system. It just auto-saves every once in a while. Anyway. Um, good night, Zyvo. Thanks for hanging out. Um, so... I forget if we have had any chance to talk about this game at all, or if I've just been playing it. Uh, but I know that we haven't talked about it in the last little bit, at least. Um, so, uh, so Sherlock Holmes. It's interesting. Um, I, you know, I think the the sort of like the killer feature. The uh, I'm I'm teaching the. Uh, finish and polish class with Jesse uh, again this semester and um, uh, that's such a fucking great class by the way uh, the so ownable position is is on my mind the ownable position for this game is definitely this um, this like ambiguous solution space that it plays with at the end of the mysteries and and honestly this like system for uh, describing and categorizing the connections between clues, uh, this like this mental brain space that it visualizes is super fascinating, really interesting, it's relevant to me um, because I have done work that sort of played in that space a little bit, um, and so I appreciate some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, but in general, just sort of like a really interesting. Uh, unique position, uh, uh, a unique stance to take as a game. Um, so if we kind of have gotten over that, which maybe we have, we may or, or may not have, um, like, is there anything else to the game? Why do we keep playing? Um, it's, it's interesting... Well, okay, so I'm not. I don't want to read too much ahead. There's there's some good questions in here, and we'll we'll talk through the questions. But it is it is interesting to think about like the serial structure of this game compared to other games that have a serial structure, implicit or explicit. So the Nancy Drew games are serial in the sense that, uh, or episodic. Which I mean, those two words mean uh, opposite things. So. Um, Nancy Drew, I guess, is fairly episodic. Um, uh, the, um, the, 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 what's the Clementine one that I'm thinking of? Uh, Zombie Day. Um, Walking Dead. The Walking Dead is serial, uh, structured serially. This one is pretty much episodic. Okay. So, um, this is, this is closer in structure to Nancy, to the Nancy Drew franchise. Uh, although obviously like instead of, um, each of the, it, it, they're miniaturized cases and there's five of them in a single game, whatever. Um, it's not serial and it, it, the fact that it's not serial, the fact that there's not like a narrative thread that carries you from one uh, chapter to the next, um, I feel like it, it feels like it's missing to me, I guess is what I'm saying, is that it feels like there's, there is a lack of something that would pull us forward from episode to episode. And that is something that I feel sort of very keenly. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that for now. And, and let's, um, let's, let's move forward. Let's do some questions. There's definitely more stuff that we can talk about here, too. So, from KFM, uh, I was finding the game a bit reserved and lacking thrills. 
But I wonder if that is part of Holmes' characters, uh, that he is perpetually unruffled and a bit emotionally detached. Do you think that it's an intentional design decision to give this game the stiff atmosphere, or am I giving it too much credit? I, well, so, um, I mean, that's a good question in general. I guess, you know, my my position in, ge in, in just generally, pretty, pretty universally, um, is going to be... God, I want to say this, but I don't. I don't think it's true in practice. I've definitely said that uh, there were effects uh, that I saw in games that I did not think were intentional. Um, where I can give uh, credit to the designers, I tend to do that. Um, where it seems like uh, this might have been an intentional effect, I'm going to assume that it was, partly because uh, even if it was, um, you know. I, something that was stumbled upon the reality of game development is that there is no game that hasn't been played a million times uh and so there's there's no way even in the most slapdash and slipshot of operations that designers haven't seen what the effect of their choices is. Now, that doesn't mean that they had all of the liberty they might have wanted to affect change in that. Um, it might actually be that they saw what happened and um, uh, would have liked to have done different something differently, but um, couldn't couldn't feasibly do that within sort of the time and budget that they had, um, and that happens sometimes. But it's it's. Uh, it is extremely unlikely that something slipped by uh, and that the designers sort of didn't realize that this is what was going to happen or this, is, this isn't what they were um, at some level intentional about doing. Also, thank you, Jester. You're absolutely right. Uh, designers never have as much liberty to affect change as they want. Um, that's, that is part of the uh, you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, art is never finished, only abandoned. Um, uh, and sometimes it's abandoned, uh, voluntarily and frequently it is abandoned, uh, because of outside pressures. Um, okay. Emotionally detached. Uh, really interesting observation. I agree with this. Uh, and there are a couple of things that I think do this, and one of them is the character of Sherlock Holmes. And along with that, so Sherlock Holmes specifically, but also this like Victorian England is a very formal society. Um, and the people that we interact with are all kind of... Um, very stiff collar. They all have some level of that emotional detachment of that sort of like um, uh, formal training uh, and um, not exactly stoicism, but this sort of like, yeah, British unruffledness. Um, I think that's part of the setting of the game and part of the character and the world that, uh, yeah, stiff upper lip. Exactly. Thank you very much. Create a beast. That's exactly right. That's the, the traditional, um, uh, way of describing that sort of British, uh, aristocratic temperament. So, um, some of that is, I think, character driven, world driven, um, and then some of it is thematically driven. Uh, the this is a game. I mean, I think this is this is traditionally true of Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, and there are certainly examples that subvert this expectation. But Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote these stories in a way that was quite dry. Um, and I don't, I don't know a lot about sort of the liter the tradition of literature at the time and, you know, whether that was just, you know, the, the, the style that that's what was common. That's what all writing was like. Um, the bottom line to me is that these are not, uh, action adventure stories. They're not stories about murders being committed. 
uh, they're they're the stories of the sort of aftermath of the murder. They're they are forensic stories, uh, and so um, by their nature and and by the nature of the genre at the time that it was written, um, which has certainly evolved since then. And, and today we have you know genres of adventure of um, forensic stories of of like uh, detective stories that are um that have a very different tone that actually explore all sorts of different tones some of them are much more action-packed some of them are uh comedic or light-hearted or romantic um but uh the sort of the basic trope of someone has come in after the action has occurred uh and is now investigating the crime um I think lends itself naturally to a sense of distance from action. Um, it is it is a less uh, it is a less. What am I trying to say? Because it's not necessarily um, is it is it necessarily less emotional? It's less uh, uh, like. Um, adrenaline like there's there I, I and i think it is less emotional i think it is by its nature less emotional i think that you can have this kind of a story with a with a character who is more or less emotive and sherlock holmes is established to be less emotive and so all of that reinforces this idea that this game is not an action game it's not a uh an active stress game it's not a game where you're going to be like hiding or sneaking or stealing or shooting or doing any of these sort of like active tense things the tension in this game and that's why i'm really interested in this one in particular the tension in this game comes from that idea of like am i am i making the correct deductions am i am i figuring this out properly um so, uh, oh, bye, KFM. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Uh, it was great to have you in chat. Um, so, I, like, I, it's an, but it's an interesting decision. And I think, it, to, it, to some extent, I feel like it's inevitable uh, because it is such a translation of the tone of Sherlock Holmes. Both the character of literature and the sort of character in our cultural imagination like we know sherlock holmes from these stories sherlock holmes is very dry he's very logical uh he's not um exciting uh but he's interesting like that is that is his power that's what's compelling about him and so um this is not nancy drew nancy drew gets herself into trouble uh, and, um, you know, she takes a very sort of like active role in investigation. She's also very social. Um, and that is part of her story. Like that, that's true to the books. And so the Nancy Drew games have a very different tone, a tone that is much more, um, social and conversational and, uh, not like gossipy, but, um, I, I guess emotionally attuned. Uh, and also more dangerous. Like, she puts herself in harm's way in order to solve cases. And that's true to her character. Um, and uh, other... I'm trying to think of other good examples to sort of, like, bounce off of. I guess those are the, the main, like, really detective uh, characters that we've, we, we have direct experience with. Um, but I think some of this is like, it's just, it's very, uh, it's part of the translation, right? It's part of the translation from one medium to another is that, um, that dryness is a tone of, of the Sherlock Holmes medium. And it, I think they, they're making it work at least to some extent in the, um, in the game as well. Uh, like that, that tone, that, um, dryness is not something that I really have a problem with playing this. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, 
earlier in chat, someone said that their immersion was negatively impacted when the game's actor makes a different deduction than you did. Do you feel a loss of immersion when Holmes reaches a conclusion you have not? Is this inevitable? Oh God, that's such a great question. Okay, so two parts of this. Um, uh, one is, uh, do you feel a loss of immersion when Holmes reaches a conclusion you have not? Uh, and for me, and I, I've sort of harped on this from episode one, um, I expect Holmes to be clever. Uh, so the thing that breaks my immersion is when I have a theory or I come to a conclusion that Holmes never acknowledges uh, in a way that makes it seem like or allows me to believe that Holmes didn't think of that, uh, which seems goofy to me that like I would be able to come up with something that Holmes didn't. When Holmes reaches a conclusion that is different than mine in a way that makes it seem like he's better at this than I am, that doesn't break my immersion. That um, It's possible for that to sort of uh, make the game less fun, although I don't think there have been any instances of that for me in this game. Um, I think I've been fine with any time that that has happened. And that, to me, like, that's very smooth. Like, Holmes coming up with an idea and stating it and, like, telling me as a player here is a possible conclusion or here is what the, the evidence is pointing to makes perfect sense. I don't mind that. So, uh, but there are instances where it is a problem, right? There are instances where it's a problem where I come up with an idea that Holmes doesn't acknowledge. And uh, is that inevitable? That's the second part of the question. Whew. Um... Yeah, man, it is. That's tough. Uh, because I don't know that it is... Like, inevitable is a very strong word. Um, I guess maybe let's just acknowledge what a difficult proposition that is. Um, because it suggests that as a writer, as a narrative designer... Um, you are, uh, you're going to be, you need to be aware of all of the potential ideas that players could have. Uh, and you need to acknowledge them when the players have them. Um, but you don't want to, um, you don't want to give too much away, right? Like you do want the player to actually go through the investigation. So at the beginning of the last, uh, the, the bloodbath, is that really what it was called? Um, the, the previous case, the third case, um, like the first thing that I thought was, oh, it must've been an ice knife. Right. Um, and, uh, Holmes didn't actually acknowledge that theory until very late in the game. And then I feel like he acknowledged it as though it were something that could have been floating around for a long time. Um, he wasn't like, aha, I've got it. Uh, it, it, it was a knife made out of ice. Um, but it, it did seem like... Um, what I really wanted as a player who's trying to have a connection to the game, who has an attachment to the experience and, and to the narrative sort of in the moment, um, I would have wanted Holmes to say, uh, you know, this, uh, th there was, uh, there was extra water at the scene. The, the blood was diluted. Um, I wonder if that could have been caused by, um, uh, you know, ice or something like that. 
it's weird for me to have that idea and for Holmes to not have that idea. So, but if he had said that, would that have taken something away from somebody who didn't immediately have that thought? This is a terrible example because I feel like who wouldn't immediately have that thought? That's such a, like, tropey sort of thing. But, um, you know, take another example then. But if somebody didn't immediately have that thought then the development of the ice knife later in the story would have been more interesting for that person. And so do you subvert, do you undercut that development by having Holmes mention it early? The only alternative that I can come up with is some kind of a method for the player to express their own ideas in a way that is coherent enough that the system can recognize what they're asking. Um, and I don't think that this game, on any Sherlock Holmes game really, that I'm, that I can picture, has a place for that. There are mystery games that do that, and um, Her Story is a great example that we've talked about before. Um, Her Story is not guiding you through the discovery of, or the narrative of solving a mystery the way that the Sherlock Holmes game is fundamentally or Nancy Drew games are fundamentally um it it depends on user input uh and it reacts to user input so the player uh if the player comes up with a crazy sort of a theory um and types it in uh, then the game will either uh react positively by saying like here's information about the thing that you're interested in or will like um you know say this is this is a dead end there's no information there um yeah uh I, it does seem like there is a, a sort of inevitability in trying to um anticipate everything that a player might think or want i think that this is hard in film um and it's substantially harder in games because of the pacing uh and this game you know it doesn't do itself any favors by being a sort of like slow and thoughtful and emotionally detached experience um, but all games have some level of if it is interactive, if it requires my input to progress the story, then the pacing is sort of at my whim. And if there's something that I'm curious about uh, or intri some, there's something that's intriguing, uh, enough for me to want to like think about it more, then there's nothing stopping me from developing all kinds of theories about it before moving on. Um, it's harder to get like fridge logic uh, in a game. Um, because the player controls the pacing. Um, you get away with fridge logic in movies because the movie just keeps going and the, the viewer sort of has to stick around to, to um, uh, keep with it. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Quinn has a fantastic like a really interesting question that I'm not sure how to answer. Um, is this game a Sherlock for being a good game in your mind? Or do you think it has problems that hold it back from being that? Uh, I mean, good game. Wow. Um, I don't know how to good game. Yes. Yeah. No, I, this is, this is, I would consider this a good game. Uh, it's definitely not a perfect game, and, and you know, seeing where they go with things, um, it may, like, pull some stuff off, or it may really not. Um, but there's definitely enough here for me to qualify this as a good game. Like, the stories are coherent, uh, even if... Um, I do feel like there's a level of arbitrariness uh, that I'm not um, entirely keen on uh, in some of these mysteries. And 
you know, I, who knows? Like that may be, it feels arbitrary to me because I don't, I haven't solved the mystery. I haven't found all the clues or something, but um, if there is, if I'm doing something wrong, then there's sort of like a, uh, inadequate feedback on that and if I'm doing it right then it feels like my choices are a little bit arbitrary um, but regardless like I can follow all of these stories um, all of them have outcomes that are reasonable uh, they're making me make choices that um, even when they're arbitrary or when they feel arbitrary feel significant like I, there's emotional weight to the choices that I make, even in the last one where I felt like, you know, I complained about how there's no way for me to decide between any of these different possible uh, scenarios where the murder uh, happened um, when I chose the wrong consequence for, uh, for, for my dude. Um, I was very upset by that and I wanted to go back and undo it. And I did um, like there's emotional weight to that. That whole system, I feel like, is not perfect, uh, and there are things that I would love to experiment with um, uh, related to that, but it, it is very cool. It's a really cool idea, um, and, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm especially interested to see how the game wraps on this idea that... Uh, you have made these de decisions um, that may or may not be uh, correct. Like, uh, does the game ever actually grapple with that? Uh, and that's not clear to me, and I really hope that it does, because I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But even just presenting that opportunity, I think, is, uh, is fascinating and is really... Um, I don't know. I don't know that it's unique. Like I don't want to say that it's unique. I don't want to say that it's it's breaking ground, but it is definitely breaking ground in the sense that it's um, it is bringing this uh, to this um, this style of game at this quality in a way that I have not seen before. That that I don't think is common. Um. So yeah, I mean, my criteria for a good game, uh, that's such a subjective term, I guess, is why this is tricky. But for me, like, uh, yeah, there are a lot of good games out there, and this, this would definitely qualify as one of them. Um, okay, alternative, uh, this is from um, Cage Tiger. Are the alternative mechanic segments, the science table, the dog... That are good at breaking up the flow monotony or do they feel gimmicky or both there are thank you for calling attention to the dog by the way because i wasn't necessarily thinking about that um it is weird some of them feel uh really like not super useful um they feel uh very mechanical in the sense that i'm just sort of like going through motions um and they're not that interesting and they seem like they're they're there to break things up that um that they are not inherently interesting um some of them are uh like some of them more well is that true i liked um i have liked doing some of the science lab stuff and i actually like the system for doing research in the archives uh that is very straightforward but it feels like doing research and it feels like i'm actually like using some amount of brain power uh to uh try to figure out like what is the article that's related to the subject that i'm interested in um i think i like the idea of some of the science experiments more than i actually liked the science experiments um doing the lock breaking 
was like super weird like that was not especially fun that seemed like just an activity um toby is also super weird like i liked being toby i liked everything about that except that like why was i suddenly toby why am i sherlock holmes like for the whole game except for this one little bit where i'm a dog um that seemed weird to me honestly you know what i would have liked better than that i would have liked a sequence where toby comes in and like takes you does all of the stuff that i did follows the scent trail and barks at the different places and you gotta follow him and find the places where he barks and then use the like little bit that we've got left over from not having to do a first person dog camera and um uh instead have like a little bit more interaction with the dog uh no i take it back i guess sherlock holmes wouldn't do that because he's a weird dude like he he's uh, emotionally unattached i uh make it so that like there's a bit where watson pets the dog at least like that seems like it should happen uh and why is that not in the game um, being the dog, being Toby was kind of odd. I feel like that was just kind of weird. Um, okay. And then the, uh, the third thing, like type of thing is, um, in the last chapter doing all of that embedded in the environment puzzle work, like all of the, uh, stepping on, on, um, you know, pressure plates and pulling levers and opening and closing doors and, um, trying to like walk, find my way through mazes. Um, that is also interesting. That feels like weird. It is different. It is very different than the like other mechanics of the game. What I'm typically doing investigating. Um, but it's, it, that was neat. I kind of, I liked that probably better than anything else. Um, I liked that it felt like I was really, I had, I was, or at least I wanted to pay attention to the environment. There wasn't as much of that as I wanted there to be, but there was some of it. Um, I liked sort of like, uh, uh, you know, figuring out the symbols in order to to find my way through a maze and then actually doing it and not having that be like a mini game having that be um embedded in the architecture of the game um i thought that was very cool i feel like the game it, like it's hard to find excuses to do that um but that was more fun to me than the like the chemistry stuff Um, <laughs> Demeter's Winter, is it just me or is Toby a thousand times more useful as a sidekick than Watson? He actually found something at least. Um, I, you know, I think traditionally Watson is not a useful sidekick, uh, except in that he is a medical doctor and occasionally it is useful for Holmes to have a medical doctor. But I think the like traditionally the idea of Holmes and Watson is that they're friends like they are they actually get along on some sort of fundamental social level in a way that Holmes doesn't always get along with people uh and um Watson finds Holmes fascinating uh and documents what he does and I think that that is good for Holmes's business like I think that there's a an a commercial element to that that um uh Watson publishes these stories and Holmes develops a reputation and that uh helps him get the cases that he finds interesting he doesn't actually care about the stories 
Um, in fact, as you know, there was a little bit of this in um, uh, in the introduction to this chapter that he's he's a little bit like derisive, uh, critical of Watson's storytelling. Um, but uh, I think he does get something out of that relationship on that level. But but also they're like friends, and Watson tags along. Uh, because he writes, he documents these adventures, um, and Holmes basically lets him do that because they're friends, and because Holmes, I think, frankly, likes having somebody around that he can explain this shit to, uh, because it lets him sort of demonstrate his ability. Um, but Watson is not a useful sidekick. Watson is a narrative device. Uh, like Watson is there to make the stories happen, uh, not to actually solve the murders, um, typically. Uh, so that, that doesn't seem like, I feel like at least Watson isn't a creepy ghost, uh, who just always shows up behind you. Uh, I feel a lot better about this game than uh, that is a reference to previous, uh, Sherlock Holmes games in this franchise that uh, that had a um, a Watson technology where uh, the game would just want him to always be around, uh, and so it would pick a place that the player couldn't see uh, and place Watson there, and that was almost always directly behind you. So you would turn around, and Watson would just be standing there. Um, Toby is adorbs, though. Toby's great. I don't remember Toby from the books. Toby is wonderful. Yay, Toby. Um, uh, from Jester, powerful barriers exist in translating this game from a serial novel. Do you think that they, the name recognition is worth the challenge in these barriers, or should developers focus on new properties built for interactive scenarios? Um, so I think one of the things that uh, that we're seeing in this game is that um, they're very they're picky about the the Doyle stories that they try to directly translate, and uh, they're fine with making up their own stories. And I think part of that is uh, so that there nobody has any familiarity with them. If you were like a Sherlock Holmes super fan, uh, and all of these stories were based on uh, Doyle books, then um, you would you would maybe not. They they want to have something in there for the super fans, right? Um, but also, I think it means that like. They can be choosy about the stories that they want to adapt, and uh, when a story is not good for adaptation to interaction, uh, then they can replace it with something else that, that works better. Um, so to me, it's not really about the mysteries. It's not about the stories themselves. Uh, it's about the characters in the world and the tone. That's what that that is the baggage that you're really carrying with you from Sherlock Holmes, um, and to me, like it does that seems totally legitimate. Like like the the I feel like they make that stuff work. I feel like the tone works for this game. I feel like okay so you are definitely you're identifying something uh that this is part of the first question that um uh that we had earlier on that would that that kfm had that was uh, about tone that was about sort of like this is really dry does that work is that intentional i think that is intentional and i think it does work generally but it also it means that this game is very dry compared to uh even a nancy drew game um, and certainly to like something that's more action oriented, uh, which a lot of games are. And so one of the things that they do is they try to break up 
the monotony of investigating stuff with these mini game activities and for the most part i feel like the mini game activities don't work really well in and of themselves they do help with the pacing but the pacing to me is its own fundamental problem that comes from the fact that investigating the scene these scenes of crimes is really tedious and um finicky i want to say like i feel like i look around uh pretty comprehensively and um i don't necessarily find everything and so if i want to make sure that i actually find everything which is super important in a game like this like there's not <coughs> there's not a ton of collectibles that i you know i don't need to care about um it's clues in the mystery they're all important um that's uh if i want to do that correctly like if i want to feel satisfied with that then i have to like really scour every one of these scenes and I have talked about how that doesn't feel like Sherlock Holmes to me, like that feels out of character, which I maintain. It's also not super fun for me because I'm not actually engaging with the environment. I almost never, it's, it is actually more of a distraction. Like if I go into a room and I look around and I look at the stuff in the room as stuff, then I'm more likely to sort of uh dismiss things that are actually important um rather than like going up to every surface and scanning it um you know essentially pixel hunting in 3d uh and disregarding the actual objects which is not super satisfying to me and not super fun and so I wish that there was a way that they had invested more in figuring out how to smooth that out, how to make it so that when Sherlock Holmes walks into a room, like he he doesn't have to get down on his hands and knees and uh, look at every surface in order to find the things that are important. The things that are important jump out at him. And, and they've got these two... I, it was really interesting to me in the first episode, in the first chapter, that they introduced two different Eagle Vision styles. Um, and I feel like we have not used them effectively in the way that I would want. And, like, really what I think I want is one of them is a... Uh, Jesus, maybe you only need one. We haven't, we've hardly used the second one. The imagination vision. Uh, you just have one that, like, essentially highlights the things in the scene that are important. Uh, and allows you to investigate them. Like, uh, like helps you out in investigating them. You can relatively quickly scan a room... Um, and maybe it's not instantaneous, like maybe there's a good way to do it where it doesn't feel like there's no work involved, but right now it's all work and like that work isn't interesting. And so if the work's not going to be interesting, I would rather the game not make me do the work, um, is sort of where I am on that. I wish Toby was our sidekick the whole time. I agree. I think that's great. It's a good, that's a good, um, uh, sequel proposal, I think. Like, it's just, it's just another Sherlock Holmes game, except Toby's there all the time. He just hangs out with you. Um, okay, Fox Stash. As game creators, do you think, uh, the plots, storylines have to be constrained to the rather barbaric themes of the original Sherlock era? Um, did they absolutely need to put mental health in such a punishing light only to have male lead characters, uh, only have male lead characters while women are only involved if they have an affair with the suspect, etc. Um, yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, 
So the history of adaptation of Sherlock Holmes into modern media is kind of fascinating. Um, and Sherlock Holmes as being such a recognizable character, uh, being having sort of such a strong cultural cachet, and also being in the public domain, um, means that uh, there's a lot of incentive for storytellers to use that character uh, in modern media. Uh, and so we have a number of Sherlock Holmes movies, some of them blockbusters. We have Sherlock Holmes games and Sherlock Holmes in games and in comics and in all sorts of places. Um, and there have been, I think, uh, sort of efforts to take the character uh, and preserve its original style and tone. Um, there have been efforts to subvert uh, its original style and tone and the era in which it was written. Um, and some of those have been, I think, uh, more successful than others, and, and some of them fall down in other ways. So Sherlock Holmes, as a, as a, as a cultural construct, it's really interesting and complicated. Uh, I mean, the, the bottom line is that, um, no, of course, they don't, they don't have to be tied to those themes uh, and they don't have to limit themselves, constrain themselves to, um, you know, that those kinds of subjects and that treatment of women and the treatment of mental illness. Um, the question for me is, uh, are they doing it uh, purposefully? Uh, are, are they sort of aware of what they're doing? in doing that and is it worth doing is there value in doing that uh rather than sort of updating the um the value structure of the sherlock holmes story uh to something that is easier more palatable i guess to a modern audience and um I mean that's that is, that can be a tough question. I think one of the things that they're they've decided to do in this game is to um, hew pretty close to the stories and the types of stories, the tropes that we see in Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, and that gets pretty weird. Um, sometimes like for me it got really weird like legitimately really weird um around all of the mental illness stuff in the last case um i also recognize i absolutely recognize that the game's treatment of women is uh is messed up um and uh not it could could be like much much better um but that is true of a lot of media. Uh, and so as, uh, I don't wanna say it's not egregious. Like I think it is, it is egregious. It is like pretty, um, uh, it's, it's pretty stark uh, in the stories that are being told here, but it's, it's also not um, limited to this kind of a, a quote unquote historical recreation or like the the this tone uh this sort of like sherlock holmes victorian england style storytelling um we have problem with problems with how we portray women in in a lot that are a lot broader than that the mental illness thing struck me like really uh that's something that i don't see a lot um, in media that I consume today, um, that kind of like uh, ignorant view of mental illness uh, and the narrative treatment of it um, that is uh, uncomplicated, I guess. Uh, uncomplicated by any sort of modern understanding of... Um, of of mental health or the 
uh, subtleties and complexities of mental health. Um, so, I don't, I mean, it's tough. It's, it's hard. There's actually, like, there's opportunities to create roles that are more interesting for women in these stories. Um, I'm not sure why they didn't take some of them. Um, it seems actually like even hewing to a Victorian era literary style doesn't entirely excuse that um, just from a just from a storytelling perspective. I mean, Sherlock Holmes had like Doyle had interesting female characters in his stories. Um, not all the time. Um, but like they were in there and looking back on the last case, the bloodbath case, like, were there any women in that story? Like any women whatsoever? Uh, I, I don't think there were, um, which is weird. Like that is, that's just like. Um, I mean, I guess it was a murder that took place in, like, a, 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 a men's facility. Um, so that sort of makes sense. But, like, um, well, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it does, it absolutely seems like it is um, uh yeah, that, that's a noticeable absence, I guess. Um, and uh, women have not been entirely absent from this story, uh, but they ha their roles have not been that interesting. Um, I mean, I think there's some defense of that in that uh, there actually aren't that many characters. Uh, and um, not all of the characters are interesting. And the characters that are interesting that are repeated, uh, it is... Um, uh, there is some amount of um, cultural stigma, I think, around the era that is being portrayed. Um, but that's not an excuse for like a total absence. Um, and it's not an excuse for um, like doing some storytelling, I guess. Uh, like the game, um, as interested as I am in the, the narrative design of this game, as sort of um, interesting as I find the conceptual uh, scale decisions that you're asking the player to make, um, the way that sort of information gets presented. The actual stories, like the stories themselves, the mysteries, the characters, um, I have not found that compelling. I have not found that like fiercely interesting. And I think that there is definitely room in the storytelling department for this game to have done better. Um, and some of that is making more interesting characters, um, characters that are, uh, that, that break some of the stereotypes that we have for, um, this historical period and the style of, uh, of story and game. Um, I think that would have gone a long way maybe to making some more interesting and memorable characters uh, that might have made those stories feel a little bit um, more interesting, easier to connect to. Um, okay, cool. Um, Brad, I'm going to stop there because it's 10. Um, there's some questions still down here. 
Um, I think. Oh, maybe that was most of the questions. Uh, so the, I mean, there are obviously other questions. I do want to, there's some other stuff to talk about. And the dragon question is actually really interesting, I think, in this case. Um, but we will, um, we will revisit that at a later date. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, thanks everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, this was fun. This was a nice end of my day. Uh, uh, it's fun playing this game with you. It's, it's, I like, um, seeing when chat has sort of interesting ideas about, uh, the game and about the case, um, that sort of helps, uh, make it, uh, make some of the slower parts, slower paced parts of the investigation a little bit more bearable for me. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for hanging out. Uh, I hope that you all had fun. Um, don't forget to, uh, check out the, uh, the forum and the steam group and the YouTube, uh, channel and the discord page and, uh, all, all of the stuff. Uh, that we have for this community where um, folks from this community can hang out and uh, and talk and uh, and do stuff um, I think that's it thank you especially to uh, subscribers anybody who's um, subscribed to this channel uh, or subscribed with twitch prime um, which I will remind you, you can do, uh, every month if you're a Amazon prime subscriber, then, um, uh, and for the folks who, uh, uh, cheered, uh, who donated bits to the channel, uh, dude, man, um, thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Uh, I, uh, expect to be back next Thursday. Um, I know that I have some weird evening stuff coming up for work in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I don't think it's going to be on Thursdays, uh, fingers crossed. So we will see, uh, I'll let you know, obviously, um, if there are schedule changes in the near future. Um, cool. Rad. Uh, we'll play some more Sherlock Holmes next time and do at least... Uh, finish out this case. Um, have a great night. Uh, have a great weekend. And uh, I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.